Britain is home to some of the most infamous true crime cases in the world, from massacres to poisonings and deadly jealous lovers. In this compilation, we'll explore all this and more. We begin by heading back to the Victorian era and a small village as we explore the tragic events of the Denham Massacre. Denham, it's quiet, it's quaint, and dare I say, it's just a little bit sleepy. This is a quintessential English village. The name itself is derived from the Old English for homestead in a valley. And in 1870, this was home to one 35-year-old Emmanuel Marshall. He lived here with his wife, Charlotte, their four children, and his elderly mother. Their house was a two-story cottage located on Cheapside Lane. Emmanuel was a successful blacksmith, and the cottage also had an offshoot which housed a forge. The family had lived in the house for a long time, more than four decades, and there was no reason why they would not continue to do so. They were well liked in the village, and over the years they had been able to get themselves to the point where they lived quite comfortably. Emmanuel and Charlotte had married in 1860, and by 1870 they had four children together. Mary, aged eight, Thurza, aged six, Gertrude, aged four, and Francis, aged 19 months. Emmanuel's father, William, had died in 1857, leaving his mother Mary a widow at the age of 64. After his death, she too moved into her son's cottage. 1870 was the middle of the Victorian era, and despite the many advances for the time, it was still the age of the horse. Now that meant that blacksmiths were still considered as highly valuable members of the community. That and the constant improvement in agricultural equipment meant that Emmanuel was always kept busy, and to that end, he occasionally had to hire extra staff. And that is a detail that we will revisit. In addition, as a blacksmith, he would have made more money than many other workers. For example, back then, a soldier earned 12 shillings a week, farm laborers 14 shillings, while blacksmiths would earn 25 shillings. As far as we know, Emmanuel was a hardworking man who spent a lot of time in the forge attached to the family home. There is not much information available about Charlotte, but the book's advertiser described her as follows. Said by her neighbors to be an excellent housewife, as well as the most respectable woman in all her habits and conduct. A very superior woman. Some intelligent persons described her children as models of neatness and the best behaved in the parish. Emmanuel's mother was also said to be a great person. Mary Marshall, the mother, aged 77, was described as a very worthy and respectable woman, to whom her son was exceedingly kind. Then there was Emmanuel's sister, Mary Ann, who also was a resident with the family at the time. Early 1870 was a happy time for her. She was engaged and her big day was finally coming on Tuesday, May the 24th in Denham Parish Church. Afterwards, Mary Ann would be moving away to Hertfordshire with her new husband. But for now, while Mary was still staying at the Marshall family home for the wedding, it had been decided that the youngest child, little Francis, would live with relatives to make more room in the cottage. The family was reportedly seen on Saturday, May 21st, by the village policeman and their neighbour, Elizabeth Simpson. They were also seen together at Uxbridge Market, perhaps buying food or other materials for the upcoming event. The following day was Sunday, and Emmanuel's usual routine was to wake up early, around 3 or 4 a.m., and work while the rest of his family still slept. Later, they would have all gone together to church, especially as the final reading of Mary Ann's bands were due to take place. However, that Sunday the Marshall family were nowhere to be seen. Monday, May the 23rd, started like any other Monday in Denham. However, there was one thing that was not quite right. 
an eerie silence surrounded the normally active Marshall residence. As Lizzie Bampton, the 11-year-old daughter of the innkeeper at the Swan Pub said, I went on Monday evening to Mrs. Marshall's house to take a dress to Mrs. Marshall to make. It was after tea. There was no answer to my knocking. Mrs. Marshall's sister came when I was there. I then left. Charlotte's sister, also named Marianne, reported what she had seen. I saw Charlotte on Friday night. I promised to take tea with her on Monday. I got no answer. Neighbours had not seen anyone. The doors were locked. I saw two men coming along. I asked one of them to get a ladder and he looked in the bedroom window and he saw bedclothes in a heap. He then looked in the back windows on the ground floor. I heard him shout, for God's sake, come here. Soon after, the door was broken down and the gruesome reason why nobody had seen the family since Saturday was revealed. The police were called and PC Charles Trevenant arrived at the scene around 7 p.m. While he had seen a lot as a police officer, nothing could have prepared him for what he was about to find inside the cottage. It was like a battlefield. Blood filled the scene. Charlotte's and Marianne's bodies were lying immediately inside the door. The bodies of the three children were found in the wash house lying together. PC Trevenor also discovered a bloodied sledgehammer and axe. Each of the victims had their night clothes on, except Charlotte, who had a dress partially over her nightdress. They had extensive injuries on their bodies and hands, possibly defensive wounds. There were pools of blood everywhere. As PC Trevor continued through the property, he went into the forge and discovered Emmanuel lying on his face with his arms stretched out. It appeared like he had been dragged. His body was covered with a sack, an apron and an old coat. A few yards from the body, PC Trevenor found another pool of blood and a poker broken in two. It was thought that this was the weapon used to create the large hole in Emmanuel's forehead. He had been beaten unrecognizable. Before that, it appeared that Emmanuel had struggled with his assailant, resulting in terrible cuts on his hands. In addition, Emmanuel's boots and other items were missing, believed to be stolen by the killer. But who could have felt so much anger towards the Marshall family, who appeared to be very well liked, that they would have butchered every single person present inside the cottage, even the children? The horrific slaying of the Marshall family shocked not only the village of just over a thousand people, but the whole country. Needless to say, a story like this quickly spread, and the police had huge pressure to catch whoever did this, and fast. Back then, investigation methods were not as sophisticated as today. Buckinghamshire Constabulary did not even possess any detectives at the time, and so the main responsibility of the Marshall family case was given to Superintendent Thomas Dunham, who had served in the police force for close to 20 years at this point. An early theory was that Emmanuel Marshall had first killed his family and then himself, but this was very quickly ruled out based on the evidence. Another theory was that the Marshall family were killed because of money that they had in the house. However, many found it hard to believe that seven people would be bludgeoned to death in such a brutal way just because of a robbery. We do know that Emmanuel had woken up early that Sunday morning to work. He had his working clothes on and he was found inside the forge. The rest of the family had still been most likely sleeping when the murderer approached the house in the darkness. As there were no signs of a struggle inside the forge, it seems that the killer was able to completely surprise Emmanuel or that he was known to him. Afterwards, Charlotte had either woken to the noise or had been awake already as she had her dress on. The assailant had then entered the house with a sledgehammer and ax to kill the rest of the family, perhaps to get rid of any possible witnesses. Then it appears he had changed his clothes as bloodstained items that didn't belong to Emmanuel were found at the scene. 
While the police did not find any evidence pointing them to a potential suspect straight away, it did not take long for Superintendent Dunham to get on the trail of the killer. A bricklayer called Charles Coombs came forward to say that a man sharing a room with him in an Uxbridge lodging house, calling himself Jack, was seen to be wearing clothes that clearly were not his, and that he had asked Charles to accompany him to pawn a pocket watch. When Charles then heard about the Marshall family massacre, he wondered if anything had been taken from the home. As Charles then mentioned Jack, the clothes and the pocket watch, he was advised to contact the superintendent. This Jack was actually John Jones, also known as John Owens, who at one point in his past had the nickname Jack the Cat Killer. A moniker he garnered due to his tendency to shoot the creatures. Not a good sign at all. John had used a stolen pistol and was sentenced to six weeks in Worcester jail for that crime. Afterwards, his list of offences only grew longer and included both theft offences and violent crimes. Whenever John decided to do honest work, he worked as a blacksmith. And that was his connection to Emmanuel Marshall. You will recall earlier when I said Emmanuel occasionally took on extra labour. One such was a Mr. John Jones. But it turns out his skill set wasn't quite as declared and he made such an awful job of repairing a carriage wheel that in the end, Emmanuel refused to pay him. The police had found their motive. Soon enough, Superintendent Dunham learned from Charles that John had traveled to the Berkshire town of Reading. Having no time to lose, Dunham caught the train to Reading as soon as he could with Charles in tow as he was the only person who knew what the suspect looked like. They arrived here at the building behind me, which at the time was Reading train station and ticket office. 5 p.m. Tuesday, the 24th of May. It didn't take them long to find John Jones. He was in the Oxford Arms public house on Silver Street. On entering, Charles identified him quickly, shouting, that's the man. Dunham leapt towards him as John tried to draw a pistol he had stolen from the marshal's cottage. He was subdued before he could fire it. As he was confronted, he said angrily, I have not murdered man, woman, nor child, but I know who did. I stood by, but never murdered anyone myself. But at this point, nobody had even told John the reason for his arrest. And he was literally standing there still wearing Emmanuel's clothes and boots and having pawn tickets for more missing property in his pockets. Superintendent Dunham knew they had the right man and John was taken back to Slough where he was almost lynched by an angry crowd at the station. It was also revealed that John was only released from prison a few days before the massacre and had been heard speaking of a man in Denham who owed him money, stating if he didn't get it off him, he'd kill him. His trial began on Friday, July 22nd, 1870, and was set to be the trial of the year, if not the decade. Somebody killing seven people at the same time was unheard of. The Crown had a strong case against John, witnesses, and a large number of exhibits to persuade the jury of the defendant's guilt. It turned out that a police officer had also seen John wearing Emmanuel's clothing on the night of the murders. While in today's murder cases, a jury might deliberate for some time, often for a number of days, in Victorian times, things were a little different and it took just two minutes for the jury to come back with a verdict. He was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging. After the judge had passed sentence, the defendants turned to him and replied, Thank you, sir. He later said that his only regret was not shooting the policeman who captured him. Jones was executed on Monday, August the 8th, 1870 at 8 a.m. in Aylesbury Jail. It seems that his only motive to slaughter the Marshall family was simply the idea that Emmanuel owed him money. The only survivor was little Francis Marshall, who had been fortunate enough to stay with relatives at the time of the murders. 
However, he only lived until the age of 18. His body was laid to rest here, along with his family that he had lost on that fateful day at St. Mary's Church. The church where they would have been attending had John Jones not committed his heinous act. The church where his sister was due to be married. The stone is a little worn and there's a plaque has been placed at the front so that everybody can clearly read the message. This is a memorial to all those who lost their lives in the Denham Massacre. Our next story has a little of everything. Jealousy, love affairs and murder. On the surface, you wouldn't think Herbert Rouse Armstrong would be capable of such things. However, you would be mistaken. Herbert Rouse Armstrong was born in Plymouth, Devon in 1869. Though his parents were by no means well off, they saved diligently so he could attend the prestigious St. Catherine's College at Cambridge University. Herbert graduated with a law degree in 1895, completed a master's in 1901, and soon had an offer from a well-known practice in Newton Abbott. Whilst he initially accepted the position, Newton Abbott didn't offer the prestige or reputation he desired. So when an opportunity presented itself to move to hay on Wye in Breckenshire, he relished the chance to make a name for himself. It wasn't long after he arrived that he married Catherine Kitty Friend, whom he had met during his time in Newton Abbott. They lived in a large home called Mayfield, which still stands today. Mayfield was a handsome home surrounded by many flower beds, which appealed to Herbert due to his long-held passion for gardening. Much stress was relieved by spending hours tending to his garden. He put particular effort into ridding the soil of dandelion weeds and produced his own concoctions for tackling them using a combination of arsenic and store-bought weed killer. Mayfield was kept well and outwardly Herbert and Kitty had a happy marriage, resulting in three children. Meanwhile, he continued to earn a name for himself whilst working at the legal practice which had paid for his relocation to the area. The owners, Mr. and Mrs. Cheese, had taken him on and shown him the ropes of the practice. They had been born and raised in the area and as such had a prestigious reputation amongst the residents there. It didn't take long for Herbert to be introduced to the Cheese's many friends, giving him the opportunity to finally rub shoulders with the creme de la creme of local society. Herbert would go on to become a prominent member of the Hay Lodge Freemasons and a church warden. Strangely, Despite being relatively fit and well, both Mr. and Mrs. Cheese died within days of each other in the summer of 1906. Naturally, Herbert succeeded the practice and took up position as the managing partner. But despite his relative success and burgeoning popularity, Herbert's home life was unpleasant to say the least. His wife Kitty was said to be a domineering woman Herbert stood at just over five foot tall and weighed just over seven stone, or roughly 45 kilograms. Catherine was taller and sturdier built, but it wasn't just her physical appearance which dwarfed her husband. Catherine was known as a controlling and overbearing wife. She ensured Herbert and their three children adhered to strict rules with no room for leniency, often admonishing them even when out in public. She only allowed her husband to smoke in one room of the house. He wasn't to drink unless unwell, and she would often cut short social outings, claiming it was bath night and therefore they must return home early. 
Over the years, Herbert had grown tired of what he perceived as controlling behavior, but he would receive some form of respite in 1914 when, due to the outbreak of war, he was enrolled to serve in the military. He had previously served in the Territorial Force, Britain's Reserve Army, where he achieved the rank of Captain. During his time in the Army, he would briefly serve in France and gain a promotion to the rank of Major. After returning from France, Herbert spent the following years traveling the country extensively. His newfound liberation from the oppressive Mayfield House was not wasted. During his travels, he was known to have pursued a number of affairs, mainly with much younger women. One such meeting he had while stationed at Christchurch, Dorset, would later prove fateful. However, Herbert's gallivanting wasn't to last. When the war ended in 1918, he returned to his civilian life and all that came with it. He resumed his legal practice and Catherine's control over his life resumed. During his absence, the only other legal practice in the area, Griffiths, based across the road from his office, had grown in popularity. The elderly owner was talking about retirement and Herbert saw a perfect opportunity to join forces with the newly appointed young partner, Oswald Martin. Herbert proposed such an arrangement to Martin and whilst his offer was declined, for a while the two practices worked cordially alongside each other, often representing the opposing sides of legal agreements such as property transfers and the like. In August 1920, just over a year after Herbert had returned from war, Catherine began to fall ill. Over the following weeks, she complained of vomiting, fevers, visions, and the partial paralysis of her hands and feet. Her condition worsened despite interventions from doctors and eventually the decision was made to commit her to an asylum. Such was her delirium. Once admitted, her condition appeared to improve and within six months, she was deemed well enough to return to Mayfield House once more on January 22nd, 1921. But once she returned home, she deteriorated rapidly, displaying the same symptoms she had experienced before. But this time, she weakened much more quickly. On February 22nd, exactly one month after returning home, Catherine died. Her cause of death was recorded as gastritis, an inflammation of the stomach, heart disease, and kidney failure. Her final words were said to be, I'm not going to die, am I? I have so much to live for, my husband and my children. Just four people attended her funeral, with Herbert said to have appeared cheery and upbeat despite his wife's passing. Catherine's will was read soon after and everything she owned had been left to him. The will was dated just one month before her admission to the asylum and superseded a will in which she had left everything to her children. In the weeks after Catherine died, Herbert held a number of dinner parties at his house. Friends observed he seemed relieved to have discovered a newfound freedom without his controlling wife in the picture. He continued with his practice, but soon became embroiled in a lengthy and therefore costly dispute with Oswald Martin. They were representing opposing sides of a property transfer for which negotiations had soured, and Herbert now owed a sum of 500 pounds to Martin, roughly 27,000 pounds today. It was around this time a box of expensive chocolates was delivered to Martin's home. Despite them having no name or tag from the sender, the chocolates were gratefully received and soon shared at a dinner party. However, it didn't take long for one of the dinner guests to become exceedingly unwell. A doctor was called and the chocolates were soon identified as being the source of the problem. It was discovered that each of the sweets had a tiny hole in the bottom and when sent for testing, the filling in the chocolates was found to contain arsenic, 
The concentration was such that had a person consumed more than two portions, they would surely have been killed. But police had no way of identifying who sent the chocolates, so no further investigation was carried out. Not long after this, Martin noticed a change in Herbert's behavior. Despite still owing Martin money, Herbert had started to show up at his practice regularly. He would often ask Martin over for lunch or afternoon tea. He even approached Mrs. Martin and asked the same. Invites would be left on his desk or in his mailbox. After three months of such incessant invites, Martin finally agreed and visited Mayfield House for lunch. Herbert appeared delighted at the opportunity to host his friend come business rival. He laid out a tea table in the drawing room with all manner of sandwiches and sweets upon it. Though they talked about business, the 500 pound debt was not mentioned. At one point, Herbert selected a scone from the spread and handed it to Martin. It was still warm, smothered in melted butter and freshly whipped cream. Martin indulged in the treat and soon had another, along with a number of cups of tea. Once the discussions came to a natural close, Martin returned home just in time for supper with his wife. Later that evening, Oswald Martin fell ill with his symptoms growing worse over the course of the night. The next day, his wife called Dr. Hinks to the house. Hinks was the same doctor that had treated Mrs. Armstrong during her sickness and who had previously been called to the Martin household after the chocolate poisoning. He knew Oswald's sickness had come on soon after he ate supper with his wife and maid, but as they were suffering no ill effects, he deduced it must have been something he ate whilst with Herbert. Not wishing to cause alarm, however, he simply continued to treat Oswald's symptoms and sent a urine sample away to be analysed in London. Sure enough, it contained extremely high levels of arsenic. Oswald had stabilised, but the bigger problem was the apparent link between the mysterious illnesses and death in a short space of time, all associated with arsenic poisoning. The police were notified of the arsenic found in the chocolates, along with details of Catherine's passing and the more recent attempt on Martin's life. Scotland Yard were called and very quickly identified Herbert as the common link between the three cases and it was well known that he regularly ordered arsenic in order to control the weeds at Mayfield House. A plan was hatched to monitor Herbert, but they needed to take utmost care to conceal the investigation. In a small town, word spreads quickly, and given Herbert's high standing and his legal profession, police could ill afford for word to get out about who they suspected in the poisoning. They went to great lengths in this endeavour, with investigators interviewing witnesses in the dark of night and leaving the town again before the sun rose. They gathered the evidence of Herbert's arsenic purchases from the local pharmacist along with medical notes from Dr. Hinks. With this information, police applied for a warrant to arrest Herbert for the attempted murder of Martin. They also secured an exhumation order for Catherine's body in order that they could assess if there was anything suspicious in her passing. On New Year's Eve 1921, police arrested Herbert Rouse Armstrong at his legal offices. Once in custody, Catherine's body was exhumed and testing of her remains showed presence of a lethal dose of arsenic and her murder was added to Herbert's charges. Herbert protested his innocence throughout his arrest and eventual trial. His attitude was so confident and his claims so convincing that many in the town decried his arrest. Many friends believed he had been framed and most pointed the finger at his rival, Oswald Martin. His trial began on the 3rd of April 1921 and throughout, Herbert's familiarity with court was evident. He knew the judge and was on first name terms with the prosecution lawyers. 
His testimony was delivered steadily. He often smiled and was courteous towards those involved in proceedings. He claimed that Kitty had been depressed and suicidal and that she had found and taken his arsenic in order to end her life. The prosecution countered this by stating that she would have been too weak in the week leading up to her death to have even left her bed. They also said her final words spoken to a nurse asking if she was going to die and saying she had so much to live for showed that she had no intention of taking her life. They also brought forward the woman who Herbert had had an affair with in Christchurch, who said that she and Mr. Armstrong had met in London several weeks after his wife's death, where he mentioned the prospect of marriage. Despite this, reporters packed the courtroom each day and their stories were consistent in their belief that Herbert would be declared innocent. On the 13th of April 1922, the jury returned its findings. They had apparently not read the script and did not accept Herbert's claims that Catherine had committed suicide and that the evidence pointed to him in Martin's case was circumstantial at best. Indeed, they found him guilty on all counts. With that, Herbert Rouse Armstrong was sentenced to death by hanging. His appeals failed and on the 31st of May 1922, he was walked from his cell to the gallows at Gloucester Prison. He maintained his innocence until the end, turning down an offer of £5,000 to admit his guilt. According to the executioner, Herbert's final words were, Kitty, I'm coming to you. He remains the only lawyer in Britain's history to be convicted of murder and hanged for his crime. In 1972, the solicitors where Armstrong had worked was taken over by Martin Beals, who also moved into Armstrong's old home. In the 90s, Beals began investigating the case and wrote a book where he posits the notion that Armstrong was in fact innocent and may have been framed by a jealous rival. Gay Gibson's future looked bright. The actress had finished a run of stage shows in South Africa and was on her way back to London to perform in the West End. However, while sailing home, an encounter with one of the stewards on board would end in tragedy. But was it murder? The 1940s were part of the golden age of ocean liners. In the days before widespread international airline travel, the luxurious ships were designed to appeal to the upper echelons of society offering such travellers an exclusive first-class travelling experience to places otherwise unreachable. And so it was that 21-year-old Eileen Isabella Ronnie Gibson found herself travelling on board the MV Durban Castle from South Africa to London in October of 1947. Eileen had just finished a successful theatre tour performing under her stage name, Gay Gibson. Miss Gibson was in an exuberant mood. The tour had been met with rave reviews and she was headed back to London to perform on the West End, a dream she had aspired to for many years. Her stateroom cabin was located on the first class deck and as such, any need or desire she could entertain would be provided during her passage. Each night she would dress in one of her glamorous gowns, brush her glistening red hair, apply rouge to her alabaster skin and set off to the ballroom for an evening of dancing and socializing with other guests and members of her theater troupe. During her time on board, Eileen's youthful and vibrant glow attracted many a man's gaze, but none more so than James Cam. From the minute Eileen stepped aboard the 30-year-old James, was captivated by her elegance and grace. But James was no first-class passenger. He was no passenger at all. He was, in fact, a ship's steward, and as such, he was forbidden from interacting with guests on board unless, at their request, he was called to assist them. 
But James couldn't resist. He made excuses to assist Eileen in some way, accidentally bumping into her in the corridors or knocking on her stateroom door. Eileen didn't appear to mind James' attention. Rather, she seemed quite charmed by him, offering coy smiles and flirtatious winks when their paths crossed. James was a handsome man, and to the young and impressionable Eileen, an onboard romance might just top off her otherwise wonderful adventure in South Africa. But James's affection towards Eileen hadn't gone unnoticed, and he was reprimanded by senior officers on board, who sternly reminded him that fraternizing with passengers was strictly forbidden by company regulations. Rather than dissuade James and indeed Eileen, it seemed to add an extra thrill to their flirty interactions. On the evening of the 17th of October, the Durban Castle held yet another dance for guests. Eileen eagerly prepared, donning her favourite black gown and bright red lipstick. She enjoyed a wonderful evening of libations and dancing with friends. At around 11.30, two of them escorted her back to her cabin. At around 1am and feeling the heat in her stateroom, she wandered up onto one of the higher decks for a cigarette. She was still wearing her gown and heels from the evening soiree. At around 3am, the watchman on duty, Frederick Steer, was alerted to a summon from cabin 126, Eileen's stateroom. The summons was a way for guests to notify stewards that they were in need of some assistance. Sir Frederick hurried down to the room, noting that both the steward and the stewardess lights were activated. In those days, women would often call upon the assistance of a stewardess to assist them in getting dressed or lacing up their corsets. On board such a fine cruise liner, the option to request assistance from either a steward or stewardess was only available to those travelling in the first class section. Sir Frederick was puzzled. It was most unusual to request assistance from both a steward and stewardess at the same time. He decided to knock and check what assistance Eileen needed. The door opened just a sliver, and backlit by the light filtering out from the stateroom, Frederick saw James. James reassured Frederick that everything was okay and gently closed the door. Assuming that James had been the first to arrive and assist Eileen, Frederick left and returned to his watch station. Others state that he believed James had made good on his bet to sleep with a passenger and left him to it. A few hours later, as per usual, Eileen's stewardess arrived to make up the room. It struck her as peculiar that the bunk was empty. There were unusual stains on the sheets and the porthole in the cabin was open. There was no sign of Eileen, and so, perplexed, she decided to notify her senior. It didn't take long for a thorough search of the ship to turn up no sign of the young actress. Rumours spread like wildfire throughout the other passengers. Someone had gone overboard. Given Frederick's account of seeing James in Eileen's room just hours earlier, the captain quickly called upon James for questioning. The steward vehemently denied any involvement in Eileen going missing and denied being inside her cabin, going as far as to say that anyone who said otherwise was lying. The captain immediately ordered the ship be turned around so they could scour the water for Gibson's body. He made an emergency radio call to the shipping company's offices in London asking that police meet the ship upon its arrival. The captain didn't reveal the true nature of the situation, stating his request for help was due to complications on board. A return message relayed from Scotland Yard instructed the captain to padlock and seal off the room, disturb nothing. The captain confined James to his cabin for the remainder of the passage. He was examined by the ship's doctor, who found scratches on his forearms, neck and shoulder. James claimed they were self-inflicted, saying that some were caused by a rough towel, while others were caused by him scratching the heat rash he suffered in hot climates. On its return to the UK, the Durban Castle stopped off at the Isle of Wight, where it was boarded by two detectives before it continued 
to Southampton. Even though the incident had occurred in waters off Guinea-Bissau, the ship was a British vessel sailing under British authority, so responsibility for any investigation fell upon that authority. Scotland Yard soon became involved and a forensic investigation quickly began. James was taken in for questioning and initially stuck to his guns about not having been in Eileen's room. When asked about whether he was in the habit of visiting female passengers in their cabin, however, he began to gleefully boast, stating, quote, Yes, some of them like us stewards better than the passengers. I have been with women passengers several times on other trips. He quickly realized that he had said too much, but when Detective Patrick Quinlan told him they didn't believe his original story. He finally told the officers there may be something in what you say. He had been in her room and he knew why the porthole was open. According to his version of events, he had visited Eileen in her cabin in the early hours. He made it very clear this was at Eileen's request. He then went on to claim that they had consensual sex and Whilst in the throes of passion, Eileen had suddenly died. Just like that, she had stopped breathing. He then panicked and feared he'd lose his job, and so he pushed Eileen, still warm, through the porthole window and into the shark-infested waters 90 miles off the coast of Africa. After doing so, he left her room and turned up for his regular morning post, hoping no one would notice Eileen's disappearance until they arrived at the next port. Showing disregard for his actions, he's quoted as also saying that she made a hell of a splash. On the 27th of October 1947, newspaper reports declared James Cam had been remanded in custody and was charged with murder on the high seas. The trial was most unusual for that era, due in part to it being one of the first cases in English legal history where a conviction was sought without there being a victim's body to examine. It also gained some notoriety as for its apparent literary similarities. In newspaper reports at the time, the murder was compared to novels by Agatha Christie. Throughout the trial, James continued to protest his innocence, claiming Eileen's death was naturally caused and not murder. He agreed that his pushing her body out of the porthole was beastly conduct, but that it was done in a state of panic and distress when Eileen had unexpectedly died during sex. I could not find any sign of life. After a struggle with the limp body, I managed to lift her to the porthole and push her through. He maintained he was an honest and good man, that the jury could trust his account of what had happened. The defense called a number of witnesses to claim that Eileen had suffered from a heart condition and had been unwell in the months before her death. They asserted it was entirely possible for her to have died of natural causes during a strenuous activity. Indeed, actress Doreen Mantle, who had shared a dressing room with Eileen during her time in South Africa, commented that Eileen was not a well girl during their tour. She recalled that Eileen would occasionally faint during rehearsals. Her lips would turn blue and she'd have to be taken aside to regain her composure. Doreen did not testify in court, however, as her father convinced her to stay in South Africa and not get involved. Even if she had, the prosecution were well prepared for such a defense. Their stance was that James had viciously strangled Eileen when she refused to have sex with him. They claimed he had seen her drinking and knowing she was intoxicated, thought she wouldn't put up much of a fight. They presented evidence from the ship of urine in the bed sheets. Medical experts took the stand and claimed this would often occur during strangulation. Investigators went so far as to remove the porthole, sections of wall and contents of the stateroom from the ship to use as exhibits in James's trial. But perhaps most damning was James's personal history. 
Not only had he changed his story about the events of the day more than six times, he also had a checkered record with women. James was a married man with a child at home. He had worked on cruise ships since he was 17 years old, and his long stints away had provided excellent opportunity to carry out a number of extramarital affairs. Eileen had been far from his first onboard conquest. He had a reputation amongst other crew members as a notorious womanizer. He even carried the nickname Don Jimmy, a play on the well-known womanizer Don Juan. He was known to brag about the number of guests he had bedded at the end of each voyage, always trying to outdo his previous record. The police investigation found no shortage of women willing to testify about James's unwanted and unrelenting advances on board previous cruises. One Miss B testified that whilst taking an afternoon nap in her cabin, she found Jimmy kneeling by her bed. I immediately got up, but before I could completely rise, Jimmy pushed me back onto my bed, holding my shoulder. I then struggled to get up, but did not succeed as Jimmy got on top of me, his whole body covering mine. In view of the weight of this man on top of me, I was unable to shout, and at the same time, he held down my shoulders and kissed me. It was all such a shock to me that I cannot remember all that happened. I told him my aunt was next door to me. This had the desired effect, and Jimmy got up, but he forced me down onto the bed again. This time, I knocked on the wall, and then Jimmy got up and told me to stay as he was going to fetch my tea. He then left my cabin. In response to the exposure of James's record of unwanted sexual advances, Eileen's own personal history was called into question by the defense. It was claimed she had spent the better part of her theatre tour bedding handsome but unquestionably married men. And in what may have caused many to gasp at the time, a contraceptive device was found in her luggage. Witnesses claimed she had told them she was pregnant in the days before boarding, and another stated she had been upgraded to a first-class cabin on the cruise liner by a nightclub owner she had met on her tour. James had told the jury Eileen had seduced him, asking him to bring her a drink in her room and opening the door wearing nothing but a yellow silk nightgown. When Eileen's mother took to the stand, she fiercely defended her daughter's reputation, stating, quote, I am proud to be the mother of Gay Gibson, one of the finest types of English womanhood physically, mentally, and morally. End quote. She also denied that Eileen owned such a nightgown as James had claimed. In fact, her sleeping attire, a set of black satin pajamas, was missing from Eileen's personal effect and is believed to be what she was wearing when forced through the porthole. After closing arguments, the jury took just 45 minutes of deliberations to determine James was guilty of murder on the high seas. Asked if he had any words to say before his sentencing, James stated, My Lord, at the beginning of the case, I pleaded not guilty. I repeat this statement now. That is all. He was sentenced to death by hanging. In a strange twist, the sentence ended up being commuted to a prison term. This was due to the British Parliament at the time considering abolishing the death penalty. This meant all pending death sentences, including James's, would be commuted until Parliament had made a ruling either way. In the midst of this unusual situation, Winston Churchill commented on the case directly stating, quote, The House of Commons has, by its vote, saved the life of the brutal, lascivious murderer who thrust the poor girl he had raped and assaulted through a porthole of the ship to the sharks, end quote. In 1948, James's appeal against his sentence was denied. 
After serving just 11 years in prison, he was released under license. Upon his release, he sold his story to the highest bidder, with papers positing the question of whether he was guilty or not. Despite the tragedy, Eileen's mother found herself having to once again defend her daughter. In the years after the event, she had also lost both her sons to accidents, leaving her and her husband mentally and emotionally broken. Things soon went quiet for both parties until 1967, when James once again found himself serving prison time after he attacked a 13-year-old girl. For this, he served just two years inside and was less keen on press coverage after his second release. Instead, he changed his name and moved to Scotland, where he worked as a waiter. However, just months later, he was arrested again, charged with sexual misconduct after attacking three 11-year-olds. He was returned to prison, where he remained until 1978. The following year, he died of heart failure. In recent times, the story has been dug up again with investigators and online sleuths claiming James should never have been charged with murder. Anthony Brown, who authored a book about Eileen's death, claimed, quote, if Gay Gibson did suffer any sort of condition that could have led to sudden natural death, it increases the chances of misadventure or manslaughter. In other words, James Cam could have been telling the truth. End quote. Eileen Isabella Ronnie Gibson's body was never found. It will never be known if she was dead or alive when she went into the freezing water. We will never be able to ascertain for certain if James forced his way into her cabin or was welcomed. However, the scratches on his body, the triggering of both steward alarms and his conduct once freed, amongst other things, certainly point to the former being true. The story of Eileen's murder has been dramatized and retold over the years from TV episodes to novels and biographies. It seems the actress, the steward and the ocean liner holds its appeal even to this day. Derek Bentley's story is one that continues to be spoken of when discussing crime and punishment in the UK. The 19-year-old was sentenced to death, though he hadn't fired the bullet or held the gun that had killed the victim. He simply said the wrong words at the wrong time. Derek William Bentley was born on June 30th, 1933 in Southwark, London, England. His family has been described as decent and stable, but Derek himself had a troubled life right from the start. In April 1938, four-year-old Derek fell 15 feet, that's five meters, from a lorry and hit his head on the pavement, breaking his nose. It's thought that this accident left Derek with brain damage and caused him to suffer from epilepsy, and he grew up having a mental age well below his physical one. According to Derek's family, their neighborhood was bombed three times during World War II, which eventually led to their home collapsing. Little Derek was inside the house at the time, and while a court would later fail to find evidence that he was physically injured in the incident, it is claimed he suffered more head injuries and a severe concussion. After failing the 11 plus examination, Derek attended Norbury Manor Secondary Modern School in 1944. Four years later, in March 1948, he and another boy were arrested for theft. On October 27, 1948, Derek was sentenced to serve three years in Kingswood Approved School, the world's oldest Methodist educational institution. During his time in Kingswood, Derek was found to have a mental age of 10 years and 4 months, while his actual age was 15 years and 6 months. It was also shown that Derek had a lower than average intelligence, scoring 66 on a December 1948 IQ test. Kingswood staff described Derek as being lazy, indifferent, voluble, and of the wise guy type. 
He was released from Kingswood a year early on July 28th, 1950, after which the young man became a bit of a recluse for the rest of the year. By March 1951, Derek had broken his isolation and was briefly employed by a furniture removal firm. But unfortunately, bad luck seemed to follow him as Derek was forced to leave after he injured his back. On February the 11th, 1952, Derek was also deemed unfit for national service due to his EEG test findings and low intelligence. One EEG from November 16, 1949 confirmed Derek had epilepsy and another one from February the 9th, 1950 also showed abnormalities. Derek continued trying to find his place in the world and was employed by Croydon Corporation as a waste collector in May 1952. However, Derek's work was deemed unsatisfactory just two months later and he was demoted to street cleaning. By September, he had been sacked. Somewhere during his struggles in life, Derek had met a young man called Christopher Craig. Christopher was 16 years old and came from a family that already had criminal connections. He was described as being cocksure and streetwise. And though older, Derek was 19 years old at the time, but due to his diagnosed mental age of 11, he looked up to Christopher. Unfortunately, this friendship would eventually lead to Derek's untimely death. Apparently, the two young men had not planned beforehand what they were about to do on Sunday, November the 2nd, 1952. Derek and Christopher just happened to meet that day by accident and between them, they resolved to attempt to rob some local businesses. Christopher was armed. He was carrying a Colt News Service .455 Webley caliber revolver with a shortened barrel so that it could be carried easily in his pocket. Christopher also provided Derek with a knife and spiked knuckle duster. The pair agreed to target confectionery manufacturer and wholesaler Barlow and Parker, the site of which was just across the road on the corner of Tamworth Road, Croydon. But as Christopher and Derek climbed over the gate and up a drain pipe onto the roof of the building at 9.15, they were seen by a nine-year-old girl who then told her parents and they contacted the police. When officers arrived at the scene, Derek and Christopher hid behind a lift housing on the flat roof of the building. Detective Sergeant Frederick Fairfax decided to climb to the roof and briefly grabbed hold of Derek, who was able to break free. What happened next has been the subject of much discussion and controversy, as stories of those present at the time do not match. According to police witnesses, DS Fairfax ordered Christopher to hand over the gun lad, after which Derek shouted, let him have it, Chris. Immediately, Christopher raised his gun and fired, striking DS Fairfax in the shoulder Still, the detective sergeant was able to arrest Derek, who apparently told the officer his friend, who was still at large, had plenty of ammunition. During his arrest, Derek did not use any kind of violence or the weapons Christopher had given him against the police. 15 minutes after Derek had been arrested, more officers arrived at the scene and were sent onto the roof. 42-year-old police constable Sidney Miles was the first to burst through the door at the top of a stairwell. He was immediately killed by Christopher with a shot hitting him just above his left eyebrow. Afterwards, Christopher continued shooting until he ran out of bullets and then jumped 30 feet or 10 meters from the roof onto a greenhouse. The attempted escape did not end well as the 16 year old broke his spine and left wrist. He was then arrested and taken to hospital. In custody, Derek was assessed by a psychiatrist. He was found to be borderline feeble-minded with a verbal score of 71, a performance IQ of 87, and a full-scale IQ of 77. Derek was also discovered to be quite illiterate. 
a prison medical officer saying he cannot even recognize or write down all the letters of the alphabet. Both Derek and Christopher were charged with the murder of PC Miles on November the 3rd, 1952. The same day, the Daily Mail published a sensational and highly inaccurate report of the incident with the following title, Chicago Gun Battle in London. Gangsters with machine guns on a roof kill detective, wound another. When the article was later fact-checked, 26 errors were found. The media did the best they could to stir public outrage, only to completely change their tack after the trial ended. Christopher and Derek were tried by a jury before the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, Lord Goddard, at the Old Bailey in London in December 1952. At the time, murder was a capital offence. However, minors under 18 could not be sentenced to death. This setting might have heavily affected the result of the trial. At first, the case appeared to be a relatively simple one. Christopher had had a gun and he had shot the officer while Derek had already been arrested. But the prosecution had a hard time telling how many shots had actually been fired and by whom. There was even doubt whether Christopher could have hit PC Miles if he had shot at him deliberately and the fatal bullet was never found. Due to modifications Christopher had made to his weapon and the use of several different undersized bullets, his shots were inaccurate. However, probably the biggest question during the trial was what Derek had meant by saying, let him have it, even though both he and Christopher denied that sentence was ever uttered. But even if he had said it, he did so after DS Fairfax had ordered Christopher to hand over his gun. In that context, many of us would think Derek simply urged Christopher to do as the officer asked. However, others thought Derek's words were indirect and he actually meant for Chris to shoot him. The latter was the prosecution's interpretation of the words, thus showing Derek had a common purpose with Christopher. This kind of situation is explained in Rex v Appleby 1940 as follows, where two persons engage in the commission of a crime with a common design of resisting by violence arrest by an officer of justice. They have a common design to do that which will amount to murder if the officer should be killed in consequence of resistance. If, therefore, an officer of justice is killed in such circumstances, both persons are guilty of murder. So even though Derek never had a gun in his hand, he would be as guilty as Christopher if they had a common purpose. And according to the prosecution, Derek's words, let him have it, were enough to prove it. Another thing the prosecution needed to prove was that Derek knew Christopher had a gun and again, language played a role. Allegedly, Derek had said, I did not know he was going to use the gun. The judge noted Derek's choice of words, the gun, as opposed to a gun. To him, Derek's language showed he had known about the gun all along. Lastly, there was the obvious controversy surrounding the question of if Derek Bentley was even fit to stand trial in the first place. His mental capacity had been proven to be low on several occasions. Derek was illiterate and of low intelligence. Yet the principal medical officer, Dr. Matheson, said he was sane and fit to plead and stand trial. At the time, there was no such thing as diminished responsibility due to mental deficiency, nor was it thought that it was cruel and unusual punishment to sentence people with intellectual disability to death. Derek underwent a cross-examination during the trial to which he was ill-prepared and did not present a very good image to the jury, which is not a big surprise considering his mental age of 11. 
On December the 11th, 1952, after only 75 minutes of deliberation, the jury returned with a guilty verdict for both Derek Bentley and Christopher Craig. However, the jury gave a recommendation for mercy in the case of Derek. They understood that this young man should not hang for someone else's crime. But in the end, a murder conviction carried a mandatory death sentence back then, so there was no way for Derek to escape hanging. Due to his age, Christopher was only ordered to be detained during Her Majesty's pleasure. The jury's recommendation for mercy was forwarded to the Home Secretary, but the judge included his own observation saying he could find no mitigating circumstances. Meanwhile, an appeal to the Court of Appeal was dismissed. Many were amazed because the Home Secretary, Sir David Maxwell Fife QC, did not just decline the plea for mercy, but also blocked all attempts by his MP colleagues to even get the matter discussed. While the opinion on Derek's case were divided, many found it hard to believe his sentence was not overturned due to the highly controversial circumstances. Protests were held around London, Whitehall, and here, outside Wandsworth Prison. But in the end, nothing could stop the inevitable. And Derek William Bentley was executed here at 9 a.m. on January the 28th, 1953. He was buried in the prison grounds until March 1966, when his remains were reinterred here at Croydon Cemetery. Christopher Craig was released from prison in May 1963 after 10 years, and he settled in Buckinghamshire. Needless to say, a lot of people were not happy with how things turned out for Derek. Since his death, those who felt Derek was subject to injustice have worked tirelessly to obtain a posthumous pardon for him. The campaign was initially led by Derek's parents until their deaths in the 1970s, after which Derek's sister, Iris, continued what they had started. Eventually, the fight for justice paid off. On July 29, 1993, Derek Bentley was granted a royal pardon regarding his sentence, but this did not quash his murder conviction. It took another five years until on July 30, 1998, the Court of Appeal finally quashed Derek's conviction for murder. Sadly, Iris had died a year before and was not there to see the victory. Linguist Malcolm Coulthard showed that Derek's words that were used against him during his trial had been heavily edited by policemen. In addition, it was ruled that Lord Chief Justice Goddard had denied Derek that fair trial that is the birthright of every British citizen. Lord Goddard was further described to have been blatantly prejudiced. Derek never really had a chance. Questions also still remain over whether the bullet that killed Officer Miles even came from Craig's gun. In his 1971 book, To Encourage the Others, David Yallop posits that Craig was too far away, his gun too inaccurate and bullets lacking enough power to have killed the officer. He goes on to propose that he may have been caught in a crossfire and that it was in fact a bullet from a police pistol that struck him. We may never know the full story. The words, a victim of British justice, still appear on Derek Bentley's gravestone. While it took 46 years and he can never get his life back, at least Derek's name was eventually cleared. This case remains an example of a terrible miscarriage of justice and shows you how linguistic evidence can be fatally flawed. Jack the Ripper is possibly Britain's most infamous serial killer. But during the 1960s, another emerged with a very similar MO. Because of this and the propensity for leaving the bodies of their victims naked, they were dubbed Jack the Stripper. On the morning of the 17th of June 1959, 
during a routine patrol here at Duke's Meadows in Chiswick, London, police stumbled across the dead body of a 21-year-old woman. She appeared to have been strangled to death. Her clothes were torn open and her throat bore vicious scratch marks. She was later identified as Elizabeth Figg, usually working under the pseudonym of Anne Phillips. During their investigation, the police questioned the owner of a nearby public house called The Ship, who stated that he had observed a parked car in Duke Meadows around five minutes after midnight. According to him, he and his wife had heard a woman screaming shortly after the driver turned off the vehicle's headlights. At the time, Duke Meadows was known to be an area frequented by sex workers, a reputation that earned it the unfortunate nickname Gobbler's Gulch. This led the authorities to believe that Fig had been murdered by one of her clients. But with no other clues, the investigation soon hit a dead end. Four years later, on November the 8th, 1963, the body of 22-year-old Gwyneth Rees was found at a council dump site in Mortlake, which is located only a few minutes away from Duke Meadows. Workers on the site were using a digger when they came across the body, accidentally decapitating it. Rees was originally from Wales, but had moved to London after being forced out by her parents due to an unwanted pregnancy. Unfortunately, unable to find work, she was forced to turn to prostitution to sustain herself. Several of her teeth were missing. It was later confirmed that she was pregnant at the time of the murder, and much like Fig, little to no evidence was found where the body was discovered. This combined with the view from the general public and the media at the time that their lives of sex workers had little to no value meant that both murders went unsolved and quickly disappeared from the news headlines. Several months later, on February the 2nd, 1964, members here at the London Corinthian Sailing Club made a gruesome discovery. In the mud beneath their floating pier, they found the body of 30-year-old Hannah Telford. She was naked, save for a pair of stockings, her underwear stuffed in her mouth. Some of her teeth were also missing. The authorities, though, didn't connect this with the case of Gwyneth Rees, who had been killed only a few months earlier. This, despite the fact that Hannah's body had been discovered just a couple of miles further downriver. Telford was a prostitute who allegedly made most of her money filming amateur pornographic videos and working at sex parties hosted by the city's elite. In fact, it was even said that she was once made to have sex with a man wearing a gorilla suit while bystanders clapped and cheered them on. The authorities interviewed hundreds of people who had allegedly been involved with Telford. However, none of them could provide any answers. Because of this, her death was ultimately ruled a suicide. But this changed on April the 8th that same year when 25-year-old Irene Lockwood was found strangled to death. Her body was recovered just a few hundred yards upstream from where Telford had been found. While Lockwood's cause of death was ruled to be drowning, marks on her neck implied that a ligature of some kind had been wrapped around it shortly before she was dumped in the river. According to the authorities, Lockwood was around four months pregnant at the time of her murder. Much like Telford, Lockwood was also known to have dabbled in sex parties and amateur pornographic videos. To earn more money, she often stole from clients and even resorted to blackmail, using photos of them having sex with her. The police initially believed that it was this scheme that had led to her death, given that one of her friends, a fellow prostitute named Vicky Pender, had previously been battered to death for doing the same thing. Two weeks later, on April 24th, 1964, the authorities stumbled upon the naked body of a 22-year-old Helen Bartholomew, who had been strangled to death in a secluded alleyway. 
three of her front teeth were missing, while her nose and cheekbone were swollen, which suggested that she had been beaten before being killed. With the discovery of Bartholomew's body, the police were finally forced to admit that there were glaring similarities between her death and that of the four other women found before her. Not only were they all sex workers, but they were also short in stature and their bodies were all found unclothed and within a small distance from each other. This pattern led the authorities to conclude that a serial killer was loose in London. Shortly afterward, a 57-year-old caretaker named Kenneth Archibald walked into a police station and confessed to murdering Irene Lockwood. He had already been questioned by the authorities during their initial investigation. However, he had denied knowing her even though one of his business cards had been found in her apartment. This time, though, he claimed to have strangled her to death during a drunken argument before throwing her in the river. Despite this confession, the authorities weren't convinced. By then, they were certain that Lockwood's death had been the work of a prolific serial killer who had also murdered Telford and Barthelemy. Archibald, on the other hand, was able to provide a solid alibi that proved he wasn't responsible for the other women's deaths. Even though the police didn't believe his story, Archibald was still arrested and put on trial, during which he retracted his confession, saying that he had only made it because he was drunk and depressed. Since his confession was the only piece of evidence that tied him to Lockwood's murder, Kenneth Archibald was acquitted and eventually released. It was Bartholomew's death that allowed the authorities to recover their first piece of solid evidence. On her body, they found traces of paint commonly used in car manufacturing, which led them to focusing their investigation on automotive businesses in the area. Unfortunately, the killer's victim count increased again on July the 14th, when a 30-year-old sex worker named Mary Fleming was found naked and slumped against the garage entrance. Her remains bore the same specks of paint that had been found on Helen Bartholomew's body. Eyewitnesses claimed to have heard a car reversing down the street just a few moments before Fleming's body was discovered. However, no one caught a glimpse of either the driver or the vehicle's license plate, which meant that the authorities were once again at a dead end. Needless to say, the rising death toll garnered a ton of media attention, with many newspapers nicknaming the serial killer Jack the Stripper for his similarity to London's other infamous killer and his penchant for leaving his victims nude. The authorities hoped this would dissuade him from striking again. After all, being in a public eye increased his chances of slipping up and being caught. However, they were sadly mistaken. On November 24th, 1964, 21-year-old Margaret McGowan was found naked and strangled to death in a side street in Kensington. Like the other victims, she was a prostitute, although she usually went by the name Frances Brown when meeting with clients. Again, specks of paint were found on her body and one of her teeth was also missing. McGowan originally came from Scotland and was well known to serve as high-end clients like businessmen and politicians. Upon investigating her background, the police discovered that she had been involved in the Perfumo Affair, a major political scandal where then Secretary of State for War John Perfumo was accused of having an extramarital affair with a 19-year-old model named Christine Keeler. One of the people involved in the scandal was a socialite named Stephen Ward, one of Keeler's close friends. During his trial, McGowan was one of the people who testified against him claiming that he frequently hired her to have sex with influential men who belonged to the upper class. Hannah Tailford, one of the killer's earliest victims, was also believed to have been involved in the Perfumo affair. Shortly after McGowan's death was made public, a sex worker named Kim Taylor 
came forward and told the police that the 21-year-old had disappeared about a month before her body was found. She had reportedly gotten into a car that belonged to a client, which led the authorities to theorize that all seven women were killed by someone they had been hired to sleep with. Taylor was able to give a description of the man she'd seen with McGowan, and that resulted in no leads, which gave Jack the Stripper all the more opportunity to strike again. And he did. On February the 16th, 1965, the naked body of 28-year-old Bridget Bridey O'Hara was found behind a storage shed in Acton, a suburb neighboring Chiswick. She was last seen on January the 11th, more than a month before she was discovered. This length of time, along with the fact that her body had been placed in a cool and dry area, meant that O'Hara's body had become partially mummified, which allowed the police to easily recover evidence. Again, specks of paint were found on her skin and several of her front teeth were also missing. Much like the other victims, she too had died of asphyxiation. O'Hara's murder put even more pressure on the police, which forced Detective Chief Superintendent John DeRose to double the number of officers working on the case. The task force decided to focus on the paint found on several of the bodies, which led them to a transformer that had been sitting just a few feet away from where O'Hara was discovered. Opposite to it was a building that housed a paint spray shop. This, the police theorized, was the killer's hideout. The breakthrough convinced the authorities that they were closing in on Jack the Stripper. Confident, Detective DeRose even gave a statement to the press saying that they had narrowed down their list of suspects to just three names and would soon make an arrest. However, this didn't happen. After O'Hara, no more bodies were discovered. An extensive search of the Heron Industrial Estate where she had been found also failed to turn up any clues. Despite police patrols and over 7,000 individuals being interviewed, the authorities were never able to identify who Jack the Stripper was. Nearly six decades have passed since the Hammersmith nude murders sent shockwaves throughout London. However, Jack the Stripper remains unknown. Later, Detective Duros would claim that he knew the killer's real identity and that he had committed suicide after realizing that the police were closing in on him. His story has never been corroborated. One of the main suspects in the case was Mungo Ireland, a Scottish security guard whom Detective DeRose named in an interview in 1970. The flecks of paint found on several of the victims had been traced to him. However, he killed himself shortly after this connection was made, leaving a note for his wife, which read in part, quote, I can't stick it any longer. To save you and the police looking for me, I'll be in the garage, end quote. Many regarded Ireland's suicide as a clear sign that he was guilty. However, recent research has suggested that he was actually in Scotland when O'Hara was murdered. Several journalists and authors who have investigated the case believe that an unnamed Metropolitan Police officer may be behind the murders. In his book, Laid Bare the Nude Murders, author and former detective Dick Kirby talks of a police officer described as a loner who was moved from one police station to another due to his strange behavior. This included deserting his patrol to view the house of serial killer John Christie, 10 Rillington Place. The officer was later found to have broken into and stolen from several businesses. When asked why he did so, he answered, my feeling, wrong as it was, was that if they thought so strongly that I was a black sheep, I will show them and be a black sheep. Another suspect in the Hammersmith nude murders case was Harold Jones, 
a convicted murderer from Wales who, in 1921, killed two young girls in his hometown of Abertillery. He was only 15 at the time, yet managed to lure both eight-year-old Frida Burnell and 11-year-old Florence Little into his home, where he strangled them to death. But despite these grisly crimes, he was given 20 years in prison rather than the death penalty due to his age. Upon his release, Jones moved to West London and settled down with a local woman. Interestingly enough, though, he worked as a caretaker at the Heron Industrial Estate, where Bridget O'Hara's body was found. It has also been noted that the murders stopped around the same time that he was diagnosed with bone cancer, from which he would eventually succumb in 1971. His previous murder conviction makes it easy to suspect Jones, but for others, the real Jack the Stripper was Freddie Mills, a professional boxer who was involved with an organized crime syndicate. Journalist and author Michael Litchfield claims in his book, The Secret Life of Freddie Mills, that Mills was a sadist who would regularly beat and abuse the prostitutes he hired. He also claims that he confessed to being the murderer to Detective DeRose, though, as the pair were Freemasons, DeRose was sworn to secrecy. Mills died in 1965, around the time the murders ended. He was found in his car with a single gunshot wound to his head. It was ruled as a suicide, but some still believe he was murdered. Despite the investigations and various suspects, the Jack the Stripper murders remain unsolved to this day, much like those of the Ripper case. Will we ever know for sure who committed these crimes? We can only hope, but it sadly seems unlikely. Perhaps you feel he's already discovered. Do you think it was one of the suspects we mentioned, or do you feel it could be someone else entirely? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. Our next case focuses on a love triangle and the woman caught in the middle. In 1967, unknown to June Cook, three people were planning her murder. Chief amongst them was her husband, Raymond. Back in June 1966, Raymond Cook of Three Farley View, Spencer's Wood, was living a seemingly picture-perfect life. He had a nice job, a wife, and two young children whom he adored. Raymond and his wife, June, a special educational needs teacher, had been married for six years and, as far as we know, had no major issues in their relationship. The two met at a conservative dance in Reading when June was 33 and Raymond 24, the pair tying the knot mere weeks later, which surprised June's family, who thought she had married beneath herself. After all, June Cook was a highly educated woman whose first husband eventually became a professor at a college in Cape Town, South Africa. Meanwhile, Raymond was an electrical engineer who had been forced to change fields after his firm was closed, becoming a student nurse. This meant a huge cut in salary. But despite their differences, the Cooks appeared happy. June was often seen with Raymond at social gatherings, and the two had camping holidays together. In addition, Raymond was often heard quoting June during lectures and discussion groups, beginning his sentences with, my wife thinks, or my wife says. Within seven years, the Cooks had two sons, whom June took to church every Sunday, while non-religious Raymond stayed home or played football. His workplace, Boracourt Hospital, had its own team, and Raymond rarely missed a match. Despite his small salary, Raymond loved his job at the hospital. Indeed, his patients loved him. But things began to change when, surprisingly, he failed to pass his finals. The possibility of this had not even crossed his mind. And according to his friends, Raymond was shattered. He lost interest in his job and began to take days off. And even though he always handled his patients professionally, his flair 
was gone. Just at that lowest moment, a new nurse candidate arrived for an interview at Borough Court. The candidate was a bright 23-year-old named Kim Newell, who had brought her elder sister, Jeanette, to the hospital with her. Another nurse, Myrtle Thompson, was standing with Raymond when they noticed the pretty blonde and her companion and jokingly asked, which one do you fancy, Ray? While Ray replied he didn't know, he also couldn't take his eyes off Kim. The once shy girl had grown up to be a beautiful young woman who had quite a reputation. Back in her hometown of Wrexham, she was known as the girl who could get out of anything just by talking. So it was not just her looks that got Kim what she wanted. Needless to say, Kim was quickly hired at Borough Court. The hospital provided care and work for people with learning difficulties and psychiatric problems. And as an assistant nurse, she began delivering articles that patients made in therapy workshops to factories in and around Reading. Raymond happened to be working in one of these workshops and he and Kim grew quite friendly. A month later, on August the 5th, the two saw each other for the first time outside the hospital when they attended a staff party at Sonning Common. That night, Kim was dressed in a stunning black dress with a square cut neck and had her golden blonde hair up in a bouffant style. Raymond was mesmerized. Even though he knew many other guests at the party, he stayed glued to Kim the whole night as if there was nobody else in the room. After the event, the two were inseparable, even at work, as one of their co-workers recalled, stating, quote, they never made any effort to hide anything. It seemed they purposely went about together in public, just out of bravado, end quote. Soon, other staff members would find themselves in the awkward situation of having to make up excuses when June Cook called the hospital to look for her husband while he was out with Kim. The hospital authorities eventually decided they were not going to tolerate such behavior and Kim was sacked. However, the affair continued. Now jobless, Kim returned to her one bedroom flat in Sidmouth Street, Reading, where she would play music loudly, shout and argue late at night while others in the building tried to sleep. She was in almost every way different than her lover's wife, but she and June both had dominating personalities, unlike Raymond. He lacked character and got hooked on Kim's way of living. Co-worker Angus MacDonald stating, once Raymond got the taste of it, he couldn't give it up. By now, Raymond had admitted to his supervisor, he was not happy in his marriage and wanted to get a divorce. By September, he was living with Kim, paying her rent and bills, spending way more money than he could afford. Over the course of five months, he had spent a total of £1,077, which is equivalent roughly of £22,300 today. Despite this heavy spending, Raymond quit his job in December 1966. Around this time, Kim found out she was pregnant. The idea of resigning had likely only become possible because the pair had come up with another, more sinister way of making money. June Cook was very well off. She had assets worth £6,670, the equivalent of £138,100 today, and she owned two houses. At some point, despite being the main breadwinner, June changed her personal account to a joint bank account so that Raymond could also access it, perhaps trying to keep him happy and save their marriage. But when he moved in with Kim, that arrangement was quickly withdrawn. She also made a new will, cutting out her husband and leaving everything to their children. Before Christmas, Raymond and Kim visited friends, Cleland and Myrtle Thompson. The conversation eventually turned to Raymond's situation with his wife and Cleland asked him if he was going to return home. But Kim didn't let her lover answer. Instead, she replied herself saying she had told Raymond he had to choose her or June. Needless to say, he decided to stay with Kim. 
But what really stood out of all the things the two couples talked about that day was Kim mentioning an argument she had had with June. She claimed she had visited her lover's wife at her home and the conversation had escalated into a fight. She told the Thompsons that June was a bitch who had a lot of money but didn't know what to do with it and added she would kill June if she thought she could get away with it and if she knew anyone who would do it for money. While nobody can say for sure what she had said sounded a lot like bait as if she was testing whether Cleland would offer to kill June for her. But instead he replied, you talk nonsense like that. If you kill her, you will have no life to live at all. Kim and Raymond visited the Thompsons again after Christmas, shortly after they had learned June had changed her will. This time Kim said she wanted Raymond to return to his wife so that June would agree to include him in the will again in his favour. And that is exactly what happened on January the 21st 1967. Raymond went back to his wife and June changed her will to read, I give and bequeath all my wills, chattels and personal property whatsoever to my husband Raymond Sidney Cook. June also mentioned their children who were to get 500 pounds each. But of course the will alone didn't do much for Raymond's current situation. He needed the money now. He didn't have time to wait for his wife's natural death. He and Kim just lacked the courage to implement the next phase of their plan. And for that reason Kim contacted a 42 year old man named Eric Jones. Kim and Eric met for the first time when she was just 15 years old and lived in the same area in Wrexham. The two eventually began a sexual relationship which resulted in Kim becoming pregnant at the age of 17. The pregnancy was aborted by Eric and now Kim was going to use that detail to her advantage. With Raymond in tow she met with Eric in a Chinese restaurant in Wrexham. During their conversation Eric boasted about a rather disturbing talent. He said he was good at removing wives and losing them. From that point forward the three began seriously discussing how to get rid of June Cook. Eventually a plan began to form. It was decided that a faux car crash was the best option as June was insured for £1,000 in the event of an accident. In effect the insurance would pay the cost of the hitman. However the question of how they would actually go about actioning their plan remained. The treacherous trio went through four separate iterations of their plot such as running June's mini car into the River Dee in North Wales but there was always something that didn't work out. Eventually Kim grew frustrated with Eric who she felt was making excuses. She called him and threatened to contact his wife and expose him for the abortions he had performed on her. There had been at least four of them. Eric didn't have any other choice than to get the deed done. On March the 8th 1967 Raymond and June dined here at the George Hotel in Pangbourne. Perhaps June was thinking everything would turn out all right in the end after all, unaware that the man she loved was plotting her death. The real reason Raymond had brought her here for dinner was to ply her with alcohol. As June and Raymond were driving home in her red mini, Eric Jones flagged them down in Rummahedge Wood pretending that his car, a blue Ford Cortina, had broken down. The pair stopped and as June knelt down to examine the damage she was struck several times across the back of the head with a car jack. The dying June was then bundled back into the red mini which was driven further down the road and into a tree. Eric and Raymond then began setting the scene. With her head injuries so severe they were going to pretend that she had flown through the windscreen and hit the tree. She was dragged out of the mini but before they could complete the setup 
two men arrived at the scene offering their help. They found Eric Jones hovering over June's body. They assumed offering first aid. As they approached, Jones told them that he would go to his car to get some blankets. He never returned. Later, Constable Sherlock received a call about the accident with him arriving at the scene around 10.50 p.m. He noted the large amount of blood in the vehicle in comparison to how little actual damage there was. The front bumper had come off, a headlight was broken, and part of the front wing had bent down onto the tire. The windscreen, however, was intact. Sherlock returned home, but at around midnight, he rang the hospital to check on June and Raymond's condition. He was told that June had died of her injuries, while Raymond was seemingly unharmed, though he seemed dazed and incoherent. The constable then decided to pay a visit to the hospital to view June's injuries and speak to Raymond. He was shocked at the extent of Mrs. Cook's injuries, but seeing that Raymond was shook up but otherwise unharmed, he offered him a lift back home. Though the doctors had said he seemed incoherent and seemed drunk, Sherlock noted that Raymond gave clear and concise directions back to his house. Whilst talking to Raymond, Sherlock discovered that June's parents lived next door, so he decided that it would be best to let them know the tragic news of their daughter's death. While speaking with them, it became very clear what they thought of Raymond. With that, Constable Sherlock decided it would be prudent to investigate what kind of person Raymond Cook was, and it didn't take long for him to learn about the affair with Kim Newell. With suspicion rising, June's body was re-examined. Initially, the pathologist, who had not seen the accident scene, had said her head injuries were caused by her flying through the windscreen and hitting the tree. This was, of course, impossible, as the screen was intact and a second examination revealed that she had, in fact, been hit over the head approximately seven times with a blunt object. Raymond was then arrested and charged with the murder of his wife. Afterwards, police turned their attention to the man who was seen hovering over June's body, but who had then fled the scene. They were able to trace the car he had driven off in to a plant hire company in Wrexham. When police turned up to investigate, they found Eric Jones climbing into the driver's seat and he was quickly dragged in for questioning. Kim Newell was brought in to be interviewed on the 23rd of March, but with little evidence to directly link her to the murder, she was released without charge. That would soon change when Ken Adams, the husband of Kim's sister Jeanette, came forward. He revealed that Kim had confided in his wife, telling her all the details of the plot and murder. She had done this because she feared Eric Jones may kill her in an effort to obfuscate his involvement. In her efforts to make sure Jones would be caught if he tried to kill her, she had unwittingly provided the evidence that would seal all three's fate. A trial took place and both Raymond Cook and Eric Jones were eventually found guilty of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. Kim Newell received the same sentence, but was convicted only for being an accessory before the fact of murder, even though she was arguably the main instigator. Kim was eventually released after serving 12 years in prison. Upon her release, she moved to Wales and worked in a school before dying of cancer at the age of 47. As it often happened just before her death, Kim Newell expressed remorse for her actions saying, June didn't deserve to die. What Kim had to say about Raymond Cook and Eric Jones embodied how unnecessary the murder was. I never loved them. I only loved my dog. Thank you for watching and if your thirst for episodes isn't quenched, why not check out our members section where you can get access to a few more. Right then, take care. And I'll see you next time with another story to make you say, 
Well, I never.